This is The State We're In. I'm Jonathan Gruber. We're calling today's show The Last Word. And in this 12-second clip you're about to hear, my first guest will sum up the entire course of her recent life. My name is Sonali Samarasinghe. I'm a journalist from Sri Lanka. Uh, in 2009, uh, I was facing threats in Sri Lanka and I um, went into exile in the United States. I met Sonali Samarasinghe at a documentary film festival in the Netherlands and she went into exile not just because of threats. Her husband was the preeminent journalist Lasanta Vikramatunga and he was assassinated by government thugs in 2009. Sri Lanka is one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a journalist. And La Santa's newspaper, where Sonali also worked, regularly accused the government of corruption and atrocities committed during the civil war there. That meant they had to take extra precautions when they decided to get married. We had printed our invitations for the church service, and we were getting so many threats at that time with our work that we thought being so public in a church, a church is so public, you, you can't do anything, people can just walk in and out, that we thought that even if we were walking out, as we walk out of the service, um, we were there open. And so we had to uh, cancel the church service, and we had to have the church service, actually we had to get the priest down to my home and have the church service at home. Uh, so uh, we got the priest down and we, we got married. Um, that was on the 20th of December. What threats were you getting? Um, by that time, we had been getting uh, uh, emails. We were getting uh, information from people we knew, sources who were very close to us or sources from the army, and we were getting telephone calls. What exactly were they saying? Uh, they were saying, we are going to, uh, you know, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to be killed. Most, mostly they were to my husband. And, and he also got, um, in the post, he got letters. And what did they say? Just kill. One said just kill in red ink. So it looked like uh, blood, but it's, it was red ink. What would you guys think when you would get these threats? We were thinking they're just like the, uh, what we got before. You know, we'd been so used to this. And we had learned to live with it. And sometimes I think you become almost complacent to threats. Looking back on it now, were you being complacent? Yes. But I wasn't being complacent on the last day. I implored my husband, don't leave. Uh, on the day it happened. Don't, don't leave the house? Don't leave the house. Then I see them. Uh, this huge black motorcycle, two men. Uh, with black visors, so you can't really see uh, anything. And my heart is now in my mouth. I said, no, let's go in straight away. I was really, really scared, really. Uh, never been so scared because they looked so, so professional. I mean, as if they were commandos. So we go in, and now my husband is calling up everyone he knows, telling them, you know, I'm I'm being followed. And the thing with my husband is he always thinks this is a story. He always thinks, yes, now I'm going to make a story out of this, and Sunday I'm going to have the biggest story, and it's going to blow everybody's mind. So he's thinking of this from a journalistic point of view. It's a story. He's not thinking of it as this is my you know, life, because he, he, he felt that they were just there to scare him. That's what he told me. And because he told me that, I believed it. What happened next? Um, and uh, so uh, by that time, the ambulance had come for the domestic aid. The domestic aid goes off. Then we realized that uh, now my husband is, is, is calling everybody. And then uh, when I say everybody, he has, he has friends in high places. He's calling them all. Did he call the police? No, he didn't. I mean, it's not even a resort. It's not even in our radar to call the police because the police, it's the police, the army, and uh, those are the tools of the government. So those are, you're, you're going back to who you are, the perpetrators of the crime. Nobody thought of calling the police. <laughs> so then I'm telling him, don't leave. Don't leave. And he's refusing this. He's refusing this entire thing. He's saying, no, you stay. You look after the, the domestic aid. You need to go to the hospital, see that she's got her, her clothes. And I'll see you in office. And I'm, I'm saying, at least change your car. I mean, we, um, my sister's 
uh, van was there. And I said, go in the van. The driver's there as well. You can go in the van. Why take your car? No, he's, he's just adamant. And when he's adamant, uh, that's what it is. And so he left. I was, I was, you know, absolutely distraught that he left. I was absolutely distraught. So he leaves. And what happens to the guys on the motorcycle? And now I rush out because now and, and while he's leaving, I have come out because he's getting into the car. So I'm with him trying to now stop him. So uh, he says, don't worry. They're just trying to scare me. I'll meet you in office. So he leaves. And this, this is all I know for myself as, as a witness. Well, then the next question I, I have to ask you is, and it's a terrible question, when did you hear that he had died? Yeah. Uh, I heard that he had died about an hour and a half later when a friend of mine, uh, a friend of ours, where is La Santa, he asked me. So I said, look in his office, he's there. And uh, he said, okay, and he cut off. Ten minutes later, he called me again, and he said, are you sure? Where is La Santa? I said, did you look in his office room? Just look in his office room. Uh, and then, and, and said, did he look? No, he said, no, Sonali, because by that time he knew. He said, no, Sonali. He didn't tell me. He just said, no, he's had an accident. Just go, go to the hospital. And then my, my sister took me there, my sister and her husband, and I see him on and I'm, I, I can go in, nobody else can, but because I was his wife, and then I see him on a gurney. And he's, uh, what I see is a big blow to his head, just behind his ear, and I see he was breathing. And so, so then they had to transfer him to give him, um, uh, they were trying to pump his heart, and they transferred him to the operating theater. And uh, a lot of doctors worked on him, and they did their best La Santa's death sparked outrage inside and outside Sri Lanka. He's been awarded honors and distinctions posthumously. And his own newspaper, The Sunday Leader, published an editorial he'd written just before he was murdered. Here's part of it. No other profession calls on its practitioners to lay down their lives for their art, save the armed forces, and, in Sri Lanka, journalism. Countless journalists have been harassed, threatened, and killed. It has been my honor to belong to all those categories, and now, especially, the last. This letter is featured in a documentary called Silent Voices, which tells the story of oppressed Sri Lankan journalists just like Sonali and Lasanta. There's a clip in the movie of the defense minister being interviewed about La Santa's death. Who is La Santa Vikram Sudhakar? He is just a murder. There are so many murder things. And he keeps asking, who is La Santa? Why are you asking about La Santa? Who is La Santa? Who is this person? His tone is incredibly dismissive. Somebody who was writing a tabloid. Yeah, but you who know, is he? But you know what's been said. I'm not concerned by... about that. What you did you see when you saw that clip? What, what did you see? People are so worried about one man. Who is La Santa? I saw an arrogance. And I saw a, a disregard for human life that was disgusting. It was absolutely disgusting. But it is emblematic of the impunity with which they worked. Can I ask you, when did you realize that you really had to leave the country? Uh, there, were, there were several incidents. Uh, there were motorcyclists who came back to the house and they were surrounding the house and the, that was one indication. The next indication was that we had two people coming into the house. I was now in hiding already. They are taking photographs, taking photographs of my nieces and nephews, asking for me, looking for me, going up and down the stairs. And so we realized there was a lot of, uh, lot of incidents like that. And then I was told by diplomats that it was actually my um, I had one person who was telling me Sonali you had uh, I, I can't tell you who it was you are in danger you'll be killed you'll be killed if you don't leave now how long had you and your husband been married two months have you been threatened since you left yes 
I have been threatened through my website. I have been threatened uh, by email. I have been threatened that I will join my husband very quickly. Uh, yes, I, I still feel intimidated because of these threats. You're in a, living in a strange country, in a strange place, under incredibly difficult circumstances. Do you ever find yourself talking to La Santa? Every day. Um, oh. You want to take a minute? I think um, uh, sometimes I forget that he's dead. You know, because sometimes you forget. Um, but I always talk to him because, um, especially if I have some kind of uh, political question, and I, I would always spar with him. And I still do that sometimes. He had, uh, he had a lot of good advice. And uh, I take it to heart now a lot more than I did when he was alive. When he was alive, I thought it was, you know, just um, a hogwash sometimes. But now <laughs> I actually listen to the, his advice. So even though he's gone, it's like the conversation is still continuing. Yes. Yeah. 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 I spoke with Sonali Samarasinga at the Movies That Matter Documentary Film Festival in The Hague. We have a link to it on our website, tswi.org. That's tiswi.org.